My grandmother threw herself out of a taxi. This is a story my grandmother would tell me when she was trying to put the fear of God in me. When she was about 30 years old, she went to a major city for a business meeting. I can't remember the specific city, but it was like New York with a huge amount of taxis and whatnot. She was supposed to meet someone at another destination, and had the hotel call a taxi. When she went outside to wait, she saw a taxi already outside. She assumed it was hers and helped herself in. She didn't notice anything special about the taxi. She told the driver the address and off they went. For about 10 minutes she didn't notice they were going a weird way. After 15 minutes she started getting worried and asked the driver where they were going. At this point, they were out of the major city, and she realized what kind of situation she was in. She tried talking to the driver, but he never spoke a word to her. She noticed they were getting closer to a skeezy hotel. So she made a decision. She noticed he never locked the doors, probably thinking she wouldn't jump out of a moving car. He didn't know my grandmother was a tough person who took care of five kids on her own and worked full time. She tucked her legs, opened the door, and rolled the hell out. She ran as fast as she could, and hid. She saw him go up and down the road a couple times, and eventually leave. When he finally left, she walked down the road to another hotel. She walked in, and asked to use their phone. They actually said no. Then, she demanded to use their phone, in the same voice she uses now to make sure I know she's serious. Yeah, they let her use the phone. She called whoever she was supposed to meet, and told them where she was, and to bring the police. They came, she filled out a report, and left. The aftermath is that the police raided the hotel and found it to house kidnapped women who were forced to prostitute themselves. She told her friend that she wanted to cut the job short and go home. He told her, you're not the type of woman to let getting kidnapped mess with your life. So she stayed in the same city she was kidnapped in, and finished her work. Stranger under the bed. I am 22 and this incident happened a year and a half ago. I had just moved into my first apartment and was in the process of moving in. The door that led into my apartment locks itself automatically when closed. So. I was going to the entrance of the apartment complex to get my mail while talking on the phone with my boyfriend. I returned to my apartment and sat on the bed while opening the mail while using the phone, I dropped the phone on the floor and it landed under the bed so I had to lie on the floor and stretch for it. I saw something that caught my eye, there was someone under my bed. My eyes widened and I choked the urge to scream. The person under my bed was lying still with his back towards me and his head to his chest, so I couldn't see his face. And he didn't see me. Trying to be rational while so many thoughts rushed through my head, I picked up the phone, said sorry I dropped my phone, I'm just gonna take a shower and call you back. The bathroom is right by my bed so I hastily walked in, quietly locked the door, turned the shower on, jumped out my window, my apartment is on the first floor, and called the police. They told me to wait nearby, but to go to across the street and see if anyone comes out the door to the apartment complex. This was during summer and it was still light out. I placed myself across the street, hiding behind a car while watching my open bathroom window and the entry door. I called my boyfriend and he came to me just before the police. I gave them my keys and they went inside. Only moments later two cops came out holding a thin and tired looking man. His eyes looked crazy, but he didn't try to get away. The policeman that had stood beside me and comforted me while the police searched through my house, I was a mess, shivering and crying told me that the man stood outside my bathroom door with one of my kitchen knives waiting for me to come out. This man had somehow crept in my entry door while I was getting my mail and hid under the bed. The man that was trying to hurt me turned out to be a homeless person and was placed in a mental hospital. My boyfriend moved in with me the very next day. Thanks for reading. I just wanted to share my story so that others might know what to do if a situation like this occurs. The police told me that what I did was truly amazing and rational, if I had screamed. This could have ended really badly for me. Babysitting gets creepy. I began babysitting at 13 to earn extra money to spend on horribly embarrassing things like Fallout Boy CDs. I would almost always work for my dad's clients, lawyer, and get referred by word of mouth. I was babysitting for this one family who had a little girl, 9, 
and a little boy, 7. The parents seemed okay, if a tad crotchety, giving me a full schedule to follow and jokingly threatening to beat any boy who might mysteriously show up after they left. It felt cruel for them to accuse me of even knowing a boy, given I basically looked like an overgrown baby with frizzy hair at that age. Almost immediately after the parents leave, the little girl sings in a creepy high-pitched voice, We're all alone now. Rightio. Cue the shining soundtrack. I know. The little boy chimed in. Let's play Assault. Looking back now, I know the kid probably just heard the term on TV, knew the word was shocking, and said it just for a reaction. I totally bought into it at the time, sputtering why I died and changing the subject quickly. These kids were hell for the next hour. I wouldn't let them watch South Park on the TV because their parents did not seem like the type to allow their precious 7 and 9 year old to watch a show like that. As soon as I said no, the little girl said casually, Oh, that's fine, we'll just go play PlayStation in the family room. Feel free to watch it out here. Nope, I knew exactly where that was headed. I said they could watch any other TV show in the living room while I made them dinner. The parents had left instructions to make them sandwiches. I could handle that. Before I had even got out the bread, I hear a massive crash. It seems like the little girl has broken a glass. Tutting and pissed, but ultimately with no way to punish her, I cleaned it up while these two incredibly weird kids watched with wide eyes. Dumping the broken glass in the trash, I went back to making the sandwiches. I'm a vegetarian, so while the kids had chicken, I'd made a simple salad one for myself. Just as I was finishing, the little boy screamed out in what, even from my hypervigilant state as an accountable teenage babysitter, sounded like a pantomime of pain. Nonetheless, I ran over to the couch in the living room to check on him. My ankle. He howled, dramatically flopping back into the couch. While I tried to figure out how he had hurt his ankle, the little girl slipped out of the room. Peripherally, I was aware of this, but didn't really pay it any mind, focused on this little boy pretending to be in pain. He kept saying I went to stand but it hurt too much, I don't know, over and over until his eyes suddenly flicked to just behind me, where I could see the little girl standing with a perturbing smile on her face. He was miraculously healed. Yeah. Praise the Lord. At this point, I was just thinking these kids were really weird, craved attention a little too much and probably needed more parental involvement. Whatever, I was 13, and that $60 was only 4 hours away. I set out the sandwiches for the two to eat at the dining table, went to get a soda, and returned. After pouring soda for the both of them, I realized they hadn't even taken a bite of their sandwiches yet. I asked them what they were waiting for. They smiled, for you to take a bite of yours. I am so glad I had a gut feeling to open the top part of bread of my sandwich. Because when I did, I saw a glass. Broken glass. Broken glass that I'd put in the trash. I stared in horror at the two little kids staring at me with menacing twin grins. I lost it, shouting, are you serious? At the very least, you could have really injured my mouth. What's wrong with you two? Instead of crying, or apologizing, or pretending to be ashamed or confused, these two little demons began laughing. Not like kids. It was too low, it wasn't that silly, free laugh kids laugh. It was low, and threatening. I'll never forget that noise. My immediate reaction was, these kids are too young to be laughing like that. I called my older sister, 17, at the time, cried about what had happened, and she came and took over for me. We left the house with chills after the parents arrived. I never babysat for those two again. What I can't get past is the level of premeditation that went into sprinkling that broken glass in my sandwich, and the totally remorseless way they responded to me getting upset. They were unlike any two kids I've ever met before terrorized for two hours. This happened when I was in college. I lived in Isla Vista, the student community at UCSB, notorious for being a party school. It fully lived up to its reputation. I like to party, but holy hell. These people were off the wall. As such, there were a lot of people who put themselves in dangerous situations, drinking to excess, not being careful, not locking doors, etc. It had a very isolated and insular vibe, and anyone who was hanging around that wasn't college-aged immediately looked out of place and strange. One night after having a few drinks, I came home to my small house where I lived with two other girls, probably around 2.30 am. We were all serious students, I was probably the least serious, actually, and when we partied it was not your typical UCSB mega rager. More like a small get-together with friends. We would often have a few people spend the night, 
sleep on our furniture or in our beds as the case may be. That night my roommates had had a few people over who I didn't know, and I saw when I returned home that one of them had opted to sleep on the couch from the shadow that I saw there, I didn't turn the light so I wouldn't wake anyone up. But as I was passing the couch to enter my bedroom, I noticed that the figure was lying very stiff. He just had this weird energy to him. He was lying down, but it was like he was putting all of his energy into lying as still and rigid as possible. I paused, and the guy quickly jerked his head to face me, without moving his limbs, so quickly that it startled me. I could see his wide open eyes glinting in the dark. Figuring that I'd startled him or that he was drunk or maybe on some kind of stimulant and unable to sleep, I just hurried past into my bedroom and locked the door. The dude made me nervous and I wasn't taking any chances. I fell asleep. At 4.30 am I woke up. There was a strange sound at the door almost like somebody was drumming their fingers against the wood very quietly. I lay still and listened. There were more quiet sounds like someone scratching the door with their fingers, which got louder and louder until it was clear that he was using both hands and scratching as fast and as hard as possible. It created an extremely loud and intimidating sound that filled me with fear. I got my cell phone and texted my roommate because I was afraid to make a sound. Your friend is freaking me out, is he coked out? Can you talk to him? He's banging and scratching on my door. She didn't text me back, probably because she was asleep. I texted my other roommate to the same effect, covering all my bases. Keep in mind that the scratching has been going on at this point for a couple minutes. I have no idea how he could have sustained it, scratching a wooden door with your fingernails can't feel good. He also grabbed at the knob and jiggled it super forcefully. Because neither of them answered, I decided to call and really wake them up, though I was scared to make a sound. I know it sounds stupid but there was something seriously horrifying about being teased like this through the door. I knew that he was trying to terrify me. I felt like a little kid but I could tell this guy was messed up or something and maybe the police needed to be called, and I wanted to loop my roommates in since it was one of their friends. The scratching stopped abruptly and I called my roommate, who answered sleepily. Yo, your friend is messed up, can you please deal with it? Do we need to call the cops? He's seriously scaring me and he was scratching at my bedroom door, really weird. She didn't say anything for several seconds and when she did speak, her voice had no sleepiness in it at all. What friend? She said. That guy that was sleeping on the couch. I said. She was quiet again. We didn't have any guys over, she said. Call the police. My adrenaline surged and I told her to please lock the bedroom door as quickly as possible. I realized that I hadn't heard scratching in a while and I had no clue where the dude had gone. Suddenly I heard a loud banging in the other end of the house, where my roommates, Lauren and Monica, shared a bedroom. The bangs were followed by the sound of them screaming in fear. I quickly dialed the police as this maniac proceeded to bang against the, luckily, locked bedroom door of my two roommates as they screamed. The heaviness of the blows left no doubt that he was trying to break the door down. I told the 911 operator the situation and she dispatched two squad cars. The police in Isla Vista are generally used to peeling drunks off the sidewalk and breaking up brawling frat brothers. This was really serious and strange and I think the dispatcher got the sense from my tone how terrified I was and she stayed on the phone with me. At one point the banging stopped and everything was quiet for a while. I talked with the dispatcher and suddenly looked down to see that this guy had slipped his fingers through the one inch gap between my door and the floor and was just kind of waggling them around, making this weird growling sound. I screamed and backed away, which is my biggest regret about this situation, since when I look back it would have been so awesome to just stomp the shit out of those fingers and hear the guy howl in pain. When the cops rolled up, I heard running and the sound of our sliding glass door opening and closing, and then he was gone. The cops never caught him. He had broken in through our side door by jimmying the lock somehow. My door was covered in what turned out to be huge gauges he'd made using a pair of scissors, which he discarded on the ground before he left. What terrifies me most about this was that I walked right past him. I looked him right in the face. I realize now that he was not trying to sleep or on drugs, but was lying so stiff like that because he was hiding. He probably heard me open the door, and freaked out because he hadn't realized there was another girl living there, and tried to blend into the couch in the darkness. He had plans for me. Yesterday I was at my sister's house with my mom watching my son and nephews play in the yard. One of my nephews, Harrison, was picking bark off a tree when I remembered an odd encounter I had as a kid. I said so weird out loud thinking about the encounter. My mom inquired what I was talking about so I told her. 
When I was a kid, I was hanging out at the pine cone forest, which was what the neighborhood kids called a small patch of trees on the side of the road. I was picking bark off of one of the trees to pass some time waiting for my friend Frankie to finish his homework and come out to play. Out of nowhere it seemed, a guy came up to me. I could smell him before I saw him. He smelled like stale cigarette smoke. I was kind of scared when I looked at him. He wasn't very old but he had a very lazy eye that was cloudy, and his teeth and fingernails were stained yellow. My mom taught me to be nice to people even if they don't look like me, so I faked a smile and said hello. What are you doing he asked me. The smell of his breath was the worst. Um I'm picking the bark off this tree. You shouldn't do that. It's like picking off the tree's skin. How would you feel if someone picked off your skin? He said while lightly pinching my arm with his sharp yellow nails. I don't know I replied and took my arm back. Just then Frankie's mom called for me out the door and told me to come and wait inside. I didn't think anything of the whole thing at the time. When I told my mom about it, she had this look of, I don't know, guilt maybe. She said that it's probably time I know the whole story. She thought I forgot about the whole encounter so she never brought it up to me. First you should know that the neighborhood I grew up in was a small tight-knit community. Everyone knew everyone and there was no reason for an outsider to come unless they knew someone there. Anyway, here's what happened with this guy. Frankie's mom, Sonia, noticed a white van with no windows parked on the side of the road how cliché right. She didn't recognize it but figured maybe it was a visitor for a neighbor. Sonia said or rather told the police, that the van had been there all morning and afternoon. She was kind of keeping an eye on it, she said she just had a bad feeling. Her house had a huge window in front facing the pine cone forest, and the van was parked next to it. She saw me waiting for Frankie and kept a constant eye on the van while holding the phone just in case. She saw the man exit the back of the van and walk up to me. As soon as she saw him grab my arm and pinch me she called the cops. That was when she called me into her house. The cops stopped the guy just outside of my neighborhood. In the back of his van were binoculars, a Polaroid camera, and pictures of me taped all over the walls and ceiling. Me at school, at my grandparents' house, at the bank with my mom. Just me everywhere I went. But that's not all. He had a key to a storage unit on him. Inside the unit they found a cabinet full of knives. A lot. Of. Knives. Pairing knives, a butcher cleaver, a thin flay knife, a melon baller, and just various knives of all shapes and sizes. There was also a few anatomy books, obstetrical equipment, duct tape, and 10 empty 5-gallon buckets. In the middle of the unit was an old bed that was used to restrain mental patients, so it had wrist and ankle straps. And the entire inside of the unit was covered in plastic wrap. My mom said he was in a high-security mental institution for the criminally insane last she heard. Murderous 10-year-old. This is a memory I've tried to block out. But the other day when my siblings and I were talking about funny stuff my dad did when he was alive and how humorously absent-minded he was as a parent, this long-forgotten memory came back to me and I can't stop thinking about it. When I was about 4 years old, I had a playground fall that resulted in a serious cut to the back of my head that needed stitches. A few weeks later my dad took me back to the doctors to have them removed. I was very brave and sat very still for the doctor, unlike the huge fuss I made having them put in. So as a reward my dad got me an ice cream and took me to the beach for a paddle. It was a very small Australian town and the beach was quite secluded. Even though it was the middle of summer there were only a handful of slightly older children swimming. Mind you without their parents. My dad walked me down to the water's edge and warned me sternly to stay in the shallow water and not to go in any deeper than my knees. Then he disappeared, I imagine to use the public restroom or something. I know that looks bad but he wasn't a bad father. As I mentioned before he could just be a bit irresponsible and absent-minded sometimes, but he meant well. It drove my mum insane. There was an older boy about 10 years old. He was paddling around a few meters away but slowly came in closer leaving the other children. Then he called me. I remember he had blonde hair and was smiling brightly. He asked me what my name and age was. I answered, also filling him in on all the important details about my trip to the doctors that morning emphasizing that I had been a very brave girl to impress him. My story seemed to amuse him and he asked why didn't I come out and swim a little deeper. I explained that I wasn't allowed in past my knees, until my dad came back because I couldn't swim very well yet and would get into trouble. He assured me that I couldn't possibly get into trouble if he was teaching me how to swim and besides my dad wouldn't see because he was gone. When I was still hesitant he added are you scared? I thought you were brave. 
so I followed him out until my feet couldn't touch the bottom and he immediately held me under. I am getting angry and upset just thinking about it. I struggled but he was more than twice my age and size. I realize now he had taken me out willingly so the other kids wouldn't know what he was up to. Drowning an unattended young child really is the perfect crime because you could very easily pass it off as an accident. Probably only moments before I lost consciousness the boy abruptly let go and my dad lifted me out of the water. I can still see the look of bewilderment mixed with fear and rage on my dad's face. Then for what seemed like a very long time, he patted my back while I screamed, sobbed and coughed over his shoulder. By the time I had settled and my father satisfied that I was okay, the boy and the other kids were long gone. Although my dad still went driving around looking for them. Had that kid stuck around I'm quite certain my dad would have killed him.